Kyle Larson dominates. It's a bad weekend to be the 48 car. Was the Cup Series race a good race? Plus, one reporter's really upset that Kyle Larson's going on a family vacation. <laughs> Welcome back to Break Hard. I'm Matt. Spent the weekend down in Charlotte. Quick down and back. Down on Saturday morning, back on Sunday night. Walked in the door about 1 a.m. Uh, Monday morning, I guess, technically. Tried to watch the first part of the race. Absolutely crashed out on the couch, uh, which was fine, but kind of, you know, you fall asleep on a couch, you wake up groggy, confused, and you're like, what the heck happened here? But really fun weekend down in Charlotte. Uh, shout out to everybody that walked up and said hello. Gave a shout out as I was walking by. Really means a lot. I genuinely appreciate every single person that walks up and says hi wants to talk just wants to give a fist bump anything like that um, truly means a lot so thank you for doing that but a very fun weekend down in charlotte got sunburn a little bit there not sure if you can see that uh, on my neck i got sunburn as well literal redneck now nice lanyard burn probably should have put sunscreen on but uh, i thought i was stronger than the sun so that was stupid of me however the racing this weekend was actually pretty decent for the most part. We'll get into Saturday in a second, but we'll start off with Sunday where Kyle Larson went out and absolutely dominated that race. Led 62 laps um, en route to his sixth victory of the season. Uh, the last time he won at the Roval, he went on to win the championship in 2021. So is this an omen to that? Yeah, potentially, maybe, who knows? But when that five car brings speed to the racetrack, they typically capitalize on it like this. They probably should have more than six wins, definitely. And every single week, they're bringing really fast race cars to the track. Just sometimes they have like eviscerating speed, which is what they had on Sunday, where it really wasn't much of a race once he got uh, the lead. Through stage number one, Shane Van Gisbergen uh, dominates that, pits, you know, to be on a strategy to eventually be in contention to win the race. Same with Kyle Larson and everybody else. Tyler Reddick stays out to win the stage. He needs those points. He needs a stage win, uh, trying to, you know, stave off elimination for him. And, you know, stage number two, you have Alex Bowman stay out, get the stage one, get the points. Again, smart move by his part there. We'll get into that in a second. And then in stage three, it was just kind of the Kyle Larson show. He's led like 1,600 laps this season, way more than anybody else. And he goes on to absolutely dominate the weekend. And hey, hats off to him and that entire crew. Like I said, they brought race winning speed once again. I will say every cup race I've been to this year, a Hendrick Motorsports car has won. So uh, you're welcome, Hendrick Motorsports and all the employees over there that get a bonus for winning. You're welcome. I'll probably I, I have tickets to Martinsville. So plan is to be at Martinsville. I also have tickets to um, Phoenix as well. I'm just saying, uh, yeah, we're currently batting a thousand in terms of Hendrick cars winning. For Larson, that's a big time win. Uh, obviously, he wins the final race of the first round at Bristol, wins the final race of the second round here at Charlotte, and it really helps out with those points, right? He gets the five extra bonus points for winning. He picks up all the points. Now he heads into uh, the round of eight with an even bigger lead than he previously had, which is good for him, good for him as he attempts to you know make it to Phoenix. The round of eight stacks up very well for him. They head to Las Vegas next weekend. If you're not aware of what Kyle Larson's finishes are in the Gen 7 car at Las Vegas, they are first, first, second, second, and a 35th mix in there. Pretty good. Uh, then you head to Homestead. Also has a uh, Gen 7 win at Homestead as well. Had a very fast car last year until he ran into the attenuator. Um, like he was in an alternate reality. Kurt Busch does the same thing in 2004, where the, the tire goes down the front stretch, and he just barely misses the attenuator there and continues on down pit road. Uh, Kyle Larson wasn't so lucky. Didn't lose a tire, just ran into the attenuator. And then you head to Martinsville, where he's won before, and he just finished second back in the springtime in that Hendrick 1-2-3 eighth place finish that they had in their 40th anniversary race. So yeah, things are stacking up pretty well for him. Chris Rebell as well. Second, or this uh, round of, the round of eight stacks up very well for him. Las Vegas, last year, he and Larson battling it out. Homestead, he won at last year. Martinsville, he's won at as well in the Gen 7 car. The 20 and the 5 are probably your juggernauts headed to, uh, to Phoenix. But the rest of the race, was this a good race? Honestly, I'm not the biggest fan of the Roval. The new change to the Roval, I don't think really spiced it up that much or really made it that big of a difference. It was nice to see a lot of guys doing crossover moves down in turn 7. I thought that worked out really well there. But... Overall, I'd probably give this race like a 68. I It was fine, dominated. You had some pretty decent battles. Like in stage two, you had a really good battle between Daniel Suarez, Bo Wallace, Joey Logano, uh, Ryan Blaney, and Chase Elliott, where the 22 and the 99 were bumping each other out of the way. Those other five, like all five of those cars were fighting for the same position. That was entertaining. We had good passing in some areas. It just felt like the race kind of was missing something. And I know a lot of people want to see this race on the oval, and I don't really disagree with that, especially with it kind of being hot and slick, and, and that could have been fun. 
Um, but I just, I don't know. It feels like the Roval maybe has run its course a little bit like Bristol Dirt had. But, you know, maybe it'll be different next year. For now, I think that it's kind of 50-50 on where I stand at it. Uh, but I'm happy there wasn't like a ton of calamity. I will absolutely say that. I, I did not want to see this race devolve into absolute chaos, which it almost had a chance to do because like with 29 laps to go in the race, uh, Austin Dillon loses his left front tire coming out of the pits. And you're like, well, first off, congrats to the team for getting a vacation here at the end of the year. But for everybody else, it's like, oh, this is really going to encourage people to bash their way through this field here. And they didn't, which is a good thing uh, overall. For the rest of the race, though, um, pretty good back and forth. You had some people making some dive bomb moves. Martin Truex, Martin Cruz Missile Truex over here, uh, sailing it down into turn seven. He's like, I got four races left in my full-time career. I don't give a dang anymore. Just went crashing into Ross Chastain. Chastain was kind of on the receiving end of what it's like to race Ross Chastain at times because he also got spun out in the front stretch chicane by Brad Keselowski and then got a one-two punch from uh, the Legacy Motor Club boys who just had an absolutely abysmal weekend at the... Uh, Roval as well. Then you had Tyler Reddick, maybe the most interesting story of the entire day, uh, getting down into turn seven early in the race. Uh, the three car spins out. Reddick's trying to check up. He touches tires with the 11 of Denny Hamlin, and it shoots him up in the air, slams back down, uh, bends a toe link. They had to come in and pit, fix it. He's like three seconds off the pace. They rebounded. They kept fixing it, kept fixing it, kept fixing it. Stage three, uh, over the course of that final run, they put on fresh tires. He goes out there and passes 14 cars to lock himself back into the round of eight, stays off elimination for another round, which is massive for him. Uh, Michael Jordan was on the pit box this weekend. Michael Jordan's security guy has that pit box on lockdown. Uh, he was there this weekend. Cool to see him, you know, get Reddick into the second or into the third round of the round of eight. But Wallace picks up a top 10 as well with a P9 finish. Uh, overall, good weekend for 2311 Racing. Denny Hamlin survives as well. It appeared that Joey Logano was out. For the first time, he would not advance to the Final Four in an even-numbered year. And then post-race happened. Remember how I said that Alex Bowman had stayed out to get the stage win and the points to really help him, you know, give himself a nice cushion so he wouldn't have to worry about elimination this round? Well, he did. He transferred. He was, on, he was in. And then in post-race inspection, they weighed the car, and he was underweight even under the 17 pound tolerance that they gave. So he's disqualified. Bad news for him because now he is back out of the playoffs. That puts uh, Joey Logano back into the playoffs. Just can't get rid of him. I told you in, I told you in my rankings this past weekend, it's not over till it's over with Joey Logano. And even when the race was over, it still wasn't over because now he is currently still in. We'll wait and see if Hendrick Motorsports is going to appeal uh, their penalty for Alex Bowman. I know some people are going to wonder, like, what happened to Shane Van Gisbergen? He sat on the pole. He led a lot of laps in the first stage. He was on the same strategy as Larson, and he was. Uh, during that first pit stop sequence, Larson jumped him in the sequence and got out in front of him. And then that was kind of just where the race was essentially won at. SVG then kind of gets put back in the pack a little bit because of the pit stop sweet, uh, sequence. Then he gets Hosovard, spun out um, in the third stage, still ended up rebounding for a seventh place finish. Uh, AJ Allmendinger, his teammate, got a sixth place finish for AJ. First time he's never won a race at the Roval during that weekend. Uh, he had won four straight at the Roval in the Xfinity Series, and then he won the Cup race there last year. Didn't win the Cup or the Xfinity race on Saturday. Didn't win the Cup race on Sunday, and that's I mean that's probably a bummer for AJ. But overall, those call guys had a good rebound for the day. Uh, just for SVG, I think if he doesn't get Hosovard. He probably gets a top three finish out of that. I don't think he had anything for Larson there at the end, um, but he had a better car than a seventh place finish, I, I think, going forward. But overall, it was a decent weekend, like a, a decent race, rather. I, I thought the race was fine. Like I said, I gave it a 68. Probably would have liked to just see um, like a better battle for the lead, more competitive up front. Uh, but it just felt like the race was missing something. I can't exactly put my finger on what it was missing, but it was it was fine. All right, so it was a bad weekend to be the 48 car. On Saturday in the Xfinity race, it appeared that Parker Kligerman was going to walk it off. He was going to win and lock himself into the round of eight, keep his championship hopes alive. He's coming to take the white flag. I'm standing on pit road for reference. I'm standing in the first pit box on pit road, right at pit out. I turn around after the cars, you know, go through the corner, look at the gigantic video board on the backstretch. You look back there, Leland Honeyman 
is buried in the tires. Like, was playing hide-and-go-seek, apparently, with NASCAR race control because he had stuffed himself in there uh, exceptionally well, better than even Noah Gragson did last year at the Chicago road course. Street course. Street course. <laughs> and I'm standing there, and I'm like, okay, like, Parker's going to come around and take the white flag here in, like, literal seconds. I mean, he's in the front stretch chicane. And I'm, you know, looking at the people around me, and we're all kind of standing there looking like, are they not throwing the caution here just so we end this race? Or like, what is going on? And then right as Parker Klugerman is underneath the flag stand, literal feet, like we're talking one to two feet from the start finish line to take the white flag, NASCAR hits the caution light. In real time, as I'm watching it, I saw what was happening on the video board. I turn around and I'm looking at the flag stand, looking at the lights, waiting for Parker to come through. To the naked eye, it appeared that Parker had taken it because I tweeted out, Parker Kligerman wins this race because NASCAR Race Control didn't throw the caution in time. I'm walking down pit road to go to the 48 pit box to stand down by victory lane. And everybody's like, this race isn't over. I'm like, what are you talking about? Yeah, it is. I watched him take the white flag. No, race control says that he did not take the white flag. And then we're all standing around the pit box there. I believe it was SVG's pit box watching the monitor shout out to the call guys for having great monitors on their pit box and yeah he missed it by about a foot the problem is the caution should have here's the thing the caution should have come out I'm not disputing that like it absolutely should have uh it should have come out 20 seconds before that but according to race control after the race uh, that area of the racetrack, they don't have a good view of, so they didn't realize that he was stuck down there. And as Jeff Gluck kind of talked about on the uh, Teardown podcast on Sunday night, he said that Juson Hamilton was the race director for the Xfinity race on Saturday, and he calls the race by looking out of the window of the, of the box in the tower. Okay, I get that. And where you're at in the tower, you absolutely cannot see where Leland Honeyman stuffed it in at. I understand that. However... You got to have spotters. You got to have camera down there. You got to have something. The billboard, the size of a football field on the backstretch showed Leland Honeyman. His 42 cars, 150 feet wide on the backstretch video board. And we didn't get a caution. What we did, it just came at a time where it created controversy that was just unnecessary. And I know NASCAR absolutely did not want that to happen, right? Like they don't want the story to be race control. It's a lot like an umpire. Like you don't want to know their name. Uh, the the average NASCAR fan should not know Juson Hamilton's name. It just is the same thing with like a, a, an umpire. You shouldn't know who Joe West is. You shouldn't know who Angel Hernandez is. You shouldn't know who uh, DJ Rayburn, like all these guys, you shouldn't know who they are. Um, it's unfortunate because the caution should have come out. I'm not disputing that. Uh, it, for Parker, it sucks because it appeared that he had won the race. They all thought they had won uh, the race there. Obviously, on the restart, he ends up losing the race. And Sam Mayer walks it off and locks himself into the next round as well, which for Parker is just absolutely gutting, right? He has four races left in his NASCAR um, Xfinity Series career as a full-time driver, almost got that first Xfinity Series win, and it didn't happen. And he was so graceful in his post-race, which is so commendable because I know there's a lot of people that would not have been. And uh, you're just gutted for the guy, right? Because... Uh, it appeared that he had it. But like I said, the caution should have come out. That's not the controversy here. It's the fact that it took so long to come out where it appeared that the 48 had won. Ultimately, the right decision was made. Um, it just created an unnecessary controversy, uh, which is a bummer. Then, of course, you have the 48 of Alex Bowman, like we talked about before, disqualified post-race for being underweight. We're going to wait and see if Hendrick Motorsports will appeal. When Hendrick Rosewood's appeals, they kind of win the appeals. So I, if I'm Joey Logano, I'm not getting too comfortable quite yet. I would assume if they do appeal, that will be heard on Wednesday, I'm guessing, uh, because it's a short week. And, well, we got to make sure that they have all this in line because, hey, cars hit the track on Saturday in Las Vegas. So bad weekend to beat the 48 right now. And on the topic of Joey Logano advancing on because of the Alex Bowman disqualification, before Bowman got disqualified... Logano missed out by four points and you're looking at it and you're like, okay, like he should have been better at four spots. He would have won at Richmond before he got ran through by Austin Dillon. And that would have given him that five extra points that he could have used to get to the next round. So ultimately Austin Dillon would have ended up costing him in that situation. Now, obviously barring what happens if they do appeal, um, 
it could still end up costing him, but it's wild how like the regular season truly does matter. And Austin Dillon running through Joy Logano at Richmond could potentially have cost him or could still cost him a shot at the round of eight, all because of that one incident. Yeah, I know a lot of people talk about regular season not mattering. It truly does matter, especially in situations like this. <laughs> the dumbest probably tweet post-race. Nick Bromberg from Yahoo. Um, he covers NASCAR, and he's covered NASCAR for a while. I genuinely think he does not like NASCAR. I don't think I've ever seen a positive tweet from this guy. Everything is always negative. Everything's always bad. And that's a way to approach it. Like, hey, by all means, do and say whatever you want to say. But not everything is doom and gloom, like he says. It's not all rain clouds and, and lightning strikes. It's sometimes just the way things are, which is okay um, in this situation. But that didn't stop Nick from saying, Kyle Larson saying he's going to Cabo this week. Uh, the semifinals begin is a little jarring. Everyone focuses in different ways, but imagine the online uproar in some circles if an athlete in another major sport said he was going on a family vacation in the middle of the playoffs. Listen, his job is on Saturday and Sunday. Uh, I don't know what you want from him here. Uh, yeah, he can go on a family vacation. I think it's fine. Like, Nick Bromberg, if you take a vacation, people aren't like, oh, my God, I can't believe he's taking a vacation during NASCAR playoffs. I can't believe he's using his own personal time how he wants to. That's crazy. There's fans out there that he has to, uh, you know, be responsible for. What? Shut up. That's stupid. No, Kyle Larson, go on vacation. Have fun. Sit on the beach. Hang out with your kids. Who cares if that's what he wants to do in his free time? Because guess what? If he stays in Charlotte, he's not going to the sim. He's been open about how much he does not like the sim this weekend he said it helped him out a lot at charlotte but like he's not going to hop in the sim for las vegas they are very comfortable heading to las vegas it's going to be okay let the guy just live his life i don't understand the uproar over people living their lives how they want to doesn't impact you relax at the end of the day this is just sports too uh yeah it's a business but like it's gonna be okay I, I promise it'll be okay for uh, Kyle Larson fans out there. So let me know in the comments what you thought about the race this weekend. Um, bad weekend to be 48. Thoughts on those penalties and thoughts on Kyle Larson taking a vacation, <laughs> which is the dumbest controversy ever. Like and subscribe to the channel. Follow me on TikTok at Break Hard, Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at Break Hard 